Please let's all stand up for the reading of the Word of God this morning. The passage that we will be going over, remember we're doing a verse-by-verse Bible study through the writings of the Apostle Paul. Remember Paul wrote over two-thirds of this New Testament. We better be familiar with his writings. We better uh, grasp them, understand them, and compare all the other scriptures to the writings of the Apostle Paul. God chose him for a specific reason and gave him specific doctrines on what we're to believe and why we are to believe it. Uh, and, and pretty much this is Romans through Philemon. These are the most important books in your Bible because um, they're written directly to the born-again child of God. So we're picking up from last week. We st- uh, finished 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, um, just real quick on a brief uh, recap of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Last week, um, Paul talked about... Um, He talked a lot about liberty, and he talked a lot about not casting stumbling blocks upon people. He talked about he talked about things such as like dietary laws and things of eating, and um, you know, and you may have the liberty to eat a certain thing, or you or you may have a liberty to do a certain thing, but just because you have that liberty doesn't mean that you should do it. The classic example, obviously, is well, alcohol alcohol is legal. It's legal. All right. Well, should we do it? Well, no, we shouldn't do it. You know, smoking pot. Yeah, that's legal now. Well, should we all go out and just start smoking pot now? <laughs> no, okay? There's things that, that, that you have liberty to do, but you shouldn't do it for the sake of the conscience of the weaker brother, for your testimony and things like that, okay? And, um, uh, you know, like, like Cain. You know, Cain said, am I, am I my brother's keeper? All sarcastically. Well, yeah, you should be your brother's keeper. You should look after the brother. You should consider the conscience of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you should. You shouldn't just ah, he, we, forget. I'm going to do what he. I'm going to do what I want to do, and they're going to do what they want to do. That's part of the Christian life. Is we have to live for the, for, you know, not just for our conscience, but for the conscience of others. Okay. So we're going to pick up on. Uh, and real quick, one last classic example I forgot to mention last week was uh, for something like Texas Hold'em. All right. What is what's wrong? Let's let's say this. What's wrong with playing Texas Hold'em? With no, with no money involved, sitting around a campfire, clean, not a doubt at the casino, sitting around playing a game of poker for fun. Well, okay, there's maybe nothing wrong with that. You may have the liberty to do that. But what if you had an uncle or something like that that was, that was addicted to gambling beforehand, and, and he said, you know what, I don't, I don't feel comfortable you know, doing this and stuff. Well, you could do it, but should you do it? No, of course you shouldn't do it for the sake of other people around you. you know? my, what, what, my, you're going to see me, am I going to go down to the bar I'm going to go sit at the bar and I'm going to get a Coca-Cola to drink. What's wrong with Coca-Cola? Well, you, could, you have the liberty to drink a Coca-Cola. Well, okay, well, you're at the bar. Then, then people are going to see you and say, well, wait a minute. So, you know, Pastor so-and-so or, or that so-and-so, they go to that church or they're supposed to be a Christian. And then they see you at a bar and you may just be eating a hamburger. You may just be eating a, you know, I'm not drinking alcohol or nothing like that. But then people see you and they say, oh, so he, he's for that. You know, he supports a place like that. So you know what I'm saying when it comes to liberty. So a lot of this chapter in chapter 8 was about convictions and liberty. And we're not to use our liberty. We have freedom in Christ. I'm free from death. I'm free from sin. I'm free. I have liberty. I'm going to go to heaven the day that I die. Okay? We have liberty. That's where true liberty is found in Christ. But Paul says not to use our liberty for an occasion to the flesh. We're saved by grace through faith in the finished works of Christ. We're saved by all the works that He did. Okay? But we're not to use grace as an excuse to sin. Uh, I'm saved by grace. I'm, I'm, I'm saved by grace. You know, God got me. So I'm just going to live my life however I want to live it. That's not good. <laughs> That's not the mindset of a, of a born-again Christian, okay? So chapter 9, we're going to get through... Um, chapter 9, we're going to try to get through verses 1 to 14, okay? Now, real quick, this is probably going to be... I'm, I'm probably the most nervous about this chapter. <laughs> This is probably out of all the sermons I preach. This is probably my nerves are, are itching up here. Uh, I don't know why. This is um, this is one of the particular chapters that you know any minister, any preacher shouldn't be all happy and, and preach us all the time. But it's in the Bible. That's why I enjoy going through the Bible verse by verse because I'm not just getting up here every Sunday just you know riding somebody's hobby horse or something and preaching on you know to all these political issues week in and week out. And well, I know that they, I know that they, this interests them and I know this interests them. So I'm just gonna go to these particular topics. Well, that's, that's not how it works. You know, not, you, there's, a ver- there's chapters in the Bible. You've got to preach the whole counsel of God. That's why I really enjoy 
there's no better way to learn the Bible than going through verse by verse, line upon line. And the thing that, like I said over and over, the thing that helped me in my fellowship and my walk with God the most is learning the Bible verse by verse. Really helped me grasp an understanding. Really helped me know my Savior. So, pray that the Lord helps me with this message this morning. First Corinthians chapter nine. I'm going to read verses one to fourteen. You may be seated. Paul says, "Am I not? Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord?" If I be an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, that'd be Peter? Or I only, and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare uh, any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say are these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth, thre uh, thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of, of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple, in which wait at the altar, or partakers of the altar? with the altar, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Uh, Brother Frank, would you mind opening us up in prayer real quick, please? Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, so we're going to start at chapter 9. We're going to start at verse number 1. Now, if I had a message for this title, it would be called... Sheep feeding the pastor. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty interesting. You're always here. You're, you're, the pastor is feeding the sheep. The pastor feed the sheep. Well, if I had a title, it's going to be the sheep feeding the pastor. <laughs> and there's a reason why I'm, I'm a little nervous up here preaching this thing. And, you know, it's not my favorite thing because a lot of this is going to be <laughs> talking about me. It's going to be talking about the, the pastor and, and what the sheep are to do. So this is going to be a hard, it's one of the hardest messages ever going to probably preach here. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Okay, so Paul lays the foundation of this argument that he's going to go about addressing here with these Corinthians. Now, keep in mind, the church of Corinth, what, what, was, what was their deal? What was their trouble? They were very carnal. They were fleshy. It was all about their, their flesh and indulging in certain appetites that they had and of lust even. You know, Paul addressed them. They had division. They had envy. There was strife. There was fornication in the church. There was, um, you know, there was trouble with eating things offered to idols. Now, the church of Corinth, there's a lot that a modern-day Christian that we can learn from, from that church. Because we know that we're living in the, you, you look up this chart over here, and this is the whole Bible laid out. We're right here. We're at the latter days of the church age where people are going to fall away. They're not going to care about the things of God. They're not going to care about what God says, and they're going to be so... In, in, intertwined with their emotions and what the media says and like I always say I, week in and week out this is the standard of absolute truth this is the, our final authority we're to listen to what God says and there's, gonna, there's a temptation in the last days that for Christians to just shut this Bible and put it on the shelf and just live their life how they want to live it and uh, that's, that's not good now Paul says am I not an apostle so the inferred answer is yes he is an apostle okay have I not and he's going to lay his argument with, you know, with his apostleship, with his office that he has. Am I not an apostle? Yes. Am I not free? Okay, now in a sense, if you want to turn there. Now, if you have a Bible in the pew, it makes it a little easier so I could just give um, page numbers. Look at, look at page number uh, 1472. Now, Paul says, am I not free? Now, we, we looked in the previous chapter um, about servants. And yes, there's some countries to this day that still have slavery enacted. 
Just because we're, you know, Americans, well, that's the thing about Americans. We come to this Bible with such a Western mentality, with such an Americanized, modernized, civilized mentality, and we forget about all the rest of the people in the world. <laughs> you know, there, there's still slavery going on. Just because Abe Lincoln, with the Emancipation Proclamation, got rid of slavery in our country, bless the Lord for that. But that don't mean that there's still slaves in other countries that are born like that, and God needs to address their situation that they're living in. That's why I love the Bible. It has a peace in it for everybody, every calling in the world. You know, we studied them chapters a couple weeks ago about marriage and divorce and remarriage and, and things like that. But So Paul's going back and saying, am I not free? Am I an apostle, Paul says? The inferred answer is yes. Am I not free? Look what he says in uh, Acts 22, verse 28. This is uh, one of when Paul's getting tried for preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going through all these trials and seeing judges. Acts twenty two twenty eight. 28, And the chief captain answered with a great sum obtained. So Paul says, With a great sum I obtained this freedom. Well, that's what the guy said, the, 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 the captain that was in charge of that. But look what Paul said. And Paul said, But I was free born. Now Paul was born a Roman citizen. Okay? He, he had, in a Roman citizen... Was, there was no slaves, there was no servants. You couldn't own people under, in the authority of Rome. And Paul uses his, his, um, his Roman citizenship a couple times because when he's going through those trials of, you know, in, in front of Rome, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. And we get one of the things we get from Rome is, well, innocent until proven guilty. You know, we still use that to this day. And that's like with the Apostle Paul, he would, he would go to that sometimes and say, you know, I'm for, I was born in Rome, and the Romans would be like, oh, well, oh, he's a Roman citizen. We, you know, we have to be careful with, with how we persecute this guy because there's not enough evidence against him. You know what Paul was being tried for? For preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and now you think about that. Are we gonna, is America going to get to that point one time or another? Of course they are. You look around all this political speech, correct speech and censorship of speech. It's going to come a day in time where you actually might get persecuted and thrown in prison because of what you believe. I mean, we're, get, we're getting there. You look around story pre street preachers and stuff, getting thrown in jail in Canada and stuff, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a way to do it. There's a wisdom to do that and stuff, and, you know, not, not name-calling and slurs and things like that. So, you know, there's a way, but that's what Paul was in trouble for. He was a free citizen. Now, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Page number, Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. That's page, uh, page number 1495. Now this is, uh, you know, we go through a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, and the best way to study the Bible is to compare Scripture with Scripture. So you got to go, you got to, that's why we do a lot of flipping and turning, because you got to see what, you know, Paul might, he may say one thing in one of his writings, but no doubt he said it in other pieces of his writings as well. So we got to put the pieces of the puzzle together so we get a, a, a greater understanding on it, okay? So look at Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 2. I like this one. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul was a free citizen, and Paul was free from the law of sin and death. Okay, you may, yeah, look, we may die, but the whole point of the rapture is God calls out the incorruptible, the, those that are dead in Christ, and and, and we which are alive and remain, one day we're going to get resurrected, have resurrected bodies. But when you get saved, you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and what He did for you on the cross, you get born again. Your spirit gets born, your soul saved. Well, what about that body? Your body don't get saved till the rapture. Your body still has a, has a choice of free will. Who am I going to serve today? Am I going to serve myself, or am I going to serve my, my Lord? So the, the, the law of sin and death has no more dominion over the Christian. It's a great blessing because Christ fulfilled the law for us. He became sin for us, okay? So Paul, he's free. He's free as a citizen, and he's free as uh, spiritually speaking, okay? Now come back, keep a bookmark in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, it's interesting, in this chapter, at the very end of it, Paul says, I, I, you know, I, I become all men to all... Uh, I become all things to all men that I might win some. Okay? Now, w what Paul's going to say here in a lot of this chapter is, Paul has rights to do things, but yet he still doesn't do them. Okay? And I, you know, I heard a great message over the weekend how us Christians blew it. 
when it comes to the thing of the rapture. Did you watch that? Brother Sam, unbelievable message. And when you think about that, we really blew it. The opportunity that we were so concerned about our rights, so concerned about wearing a mask and, and, and I'm going to jab you with this vaccine. And I'm going to, we're so, we were so fighting and pushing rights that we completely forgot to witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> At a time where people were scared and, and fear tactics in the media, he's saying this, he's saying that. We blew it. And we had a perfect open door to preach the gospel and absolutely blew it because we were so concerned about preaching these rights, these rights. You've got to watch out for that stuff. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 9, Paul's going to give his credentials, okay? Am I an apostle? Yes. Am I not free? Well, yes, he is. Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Well, sure he did. On the road to Damascus when he got saved, he's seen the Lord. Then he says, are ye not my work in the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, I have begotten you through the gospel. People say, how do I get born again? Well, it's through the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says, this is the gospel. And when you put your faith, you put your trust in the gospel, you get born again. Uh, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, that's by, you say, what am I counting on to get me to heaven? I'm trusting solely on what Jesus Christ did for me. I'm not counting on any bit of my works. Okay, now my works... After I get saved, yeah, I'm going to try to quit doing the things I used to do. I'm going to try to clean up the way I talk. I'm going to try to clean up what I touch and where my feet go. And you're like a baby. You've got to learn how to walk and talk and what to put. Don't put this in your mouth. You've got to learn some things once you're born again, okay? But the moment you put your faith and trust in the gospel of salvation, you instantaneously get sealed. And Paul said, are you not my work in the Lord? Well, yes, they were. Paul set up churches in, in, in Corinth, Okay. Now, obviously, one of the things, I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but one of the things, the prerequisites of being an apostle is obvious they had to see the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Now, in this day and age, in the dispensation we're living in, we don't, there's no apostles living, okay? Now, there, there was signs of an apostle, okay? Now, you're, you're going to get this in all various other people say, well, I'm an apostle. Okay, the Bible says if you drink any deadly thing, it's not going to hurt you. Here's a cup of Clorox bleach. Let me see you take this thing down. <laughs> So there, there's people, and the, they, were, they were warning about that in the early church, and there was people out there saying there were false apostles, okay? Uh, and no doubt that they were going through that, but Paul, the apostles, they had the signs and wonders of an apostle. They'd, lead, they, they'd hold their hands on the, on the sick. They would give Paul a little handkerchief, and Paul would bless that handkerchief, and, and the whole house was healed. And nowadays, nowadays and age, there's people that go by and, and think that they're healers and stuff like that, which is crazy. Hey, come down to the Monroeville Convention Center and we'll lay hands on you and heal you are. Why, why aren't you going into Forbes Hospital and laying hands on all the sick people in the beds <laughs> if you truly had the signs and wonders of an apostle? So you've got to watch out for a lot, of, you know, a, lot, a lot of phony stuff that they play on Christians' emotions. They play on your sensations. We've got to go by the Word of God. And you'll see at the end of Paul's ministry, he said, I left Timothy... I left Trophimus on the island of Miletum sick. Why would you, you leave him sick, Paul? You had the signs of an, you were the, you were an apostle. Why didn't you help his belly ache? You left him on the island sick. Because there's a fading away of the signs of the apostles. The whole thing of signs in the Bible was to the Jews, and it was to confirm the word. They had no written word of God. So they had to see these literal miracles in order for people to believe them. Nowadays, what have we got? We got God's absolute, perfect, completed Bible. So we don't, we don't, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't need to see all these miracles and healings and sensations. We believe in healing. We pray for healing. We believe in the power of God healing people, but we don't believe in healers, per se. People always slander the Baptist. Oh, they don't believe in God healing people. Get out of here. I've seen God heal many people in my life. I've seen God heal, I've seen God heal animals <laughs> and pets and stuff. God heals. But don't come up to me and, and, and act like, you know, people, I'm the healer. I'm going to lay my hands and I'm going to, I got the signs of an apostle. No, you're not. You're a phony. If you want the signs of an apostle, here, I'll, I'll, get, I'll run by you this list. You get bit by a serpent, nothing, it ain't going to hurt you. Paul got bit by a serpent, didn't hurt him at all. He was an apostle. I didn't want to go spend too much time. We'll get, we'll get to them signs when we get to chapter 14 and speaking in tongues. And we'll, we'll get to that when we get to chapter 14. But let's get back to verse number one. Are you not my work in the Lord? Well, yes, they are. If I be not an apostle unto others. So there's some people who are accusing the Apostle Paul. That guy's a fake. The Apostle Paul, he ain't no, he ain't, I'm not listening to that guy. Remember in the early book of Corinth where some of them said, I'm of Cephas. I follow Peter. 
I am of Apollos. I follow Apollos. I am of Christ. Well, they're back under Christ's earthly ministry. Listen, Jesus Christ had three and a half years of teaching and preaching to the Jews. But it don't stop there. It continues to go on. And Jesus Christ showed, uh, picked the Apostle Paul and gave him all these doctrines and all what to believe and why we believe it. He gave that to Paul. So there's some good, great, wonderful things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Jesus' is our earthly ministry. But look, you've got to keep on reading the book. You've got to keep progressing. There's a lot more that God revealed that's called progressive revelation. He revealed to the Apostle Paul and Paul dispensed it to other people to teach and preach. That's the whole books of 1 Timothy and Titus and all that. So he says, If I be not an apostle unto you, unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. Okay, now, now look at this, what he says. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So Paul's saying he led, to, he led, uh, he led those that were Corinth, uh, to those in Corinth, he led them to Christ. And that's one of the trademarks, that's one of the seals that I'm truly an apostle. Now, here's another, look at verse number three. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Now, it's interesting because if you're called into the ministry, if you're called into, you're going to have people examine you left and right. That's part of being in the ministry. You're going to have people that, that don't have the dedication to come to church for six months. It's going to be those people that scrutinize you, criticize you, and say, well, if I was, I would, I would do it this way, and I would do it this way, and I wouldn't say it like that. I would teach it like this. And, and, and a lot of the persecution that you're going to get from being a pastor or being a minister is from, from people that don't know really nothing about church, don't know nothing about spiritual affairs. You know, they, they got the spiritual discernment of, of a little tiny baby. They don't know much at all. And it's going to be those people that are always examining you. And that's part of the preacher. That's one of the things when I was struggling and trying to run away, you know, Lord's calling me to preach and He saved me preach and teach His book. And that's like, well, wait, Lord, now that means I can't do certain things. That means I've got to give up some things that I enjoy doing in my life for the sake of other people, for the sake of my testimony. And you better believe I fought that hard. <laughs> I got, what do you mean? I've got, got to give up this. I've got to give up that. And that's part of it. The old saying, you know, you've got to walk the walk and you can't just talk the talk and stuff like that. And that's, all, that's one of the hard things that the Lord, and, you're gonna, and here's the thing, when you preach the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have a spotlight on you and people are going to examine you and they're going to try to find every single little fault in you when you fall so that they can just go around and justify the way that they're living still. Oh, well, you know, preacher son, so he does this and he does that and he said that. And so therefore, I'm just going to continue doing my thing. That's why you got to keep your eyes on your own, on your own paper. You know, run your own race. Quit looking around at other people and stuff like that because look at Paul. My answer to them that do examine me is this. People examine Paul. You get called into the ministry, they're going to examine you. And if you can't handle that, well then then the ministry ain't, that's not for it, okay? People are going to examine you, all right? That should get us to uphold our testimony of how others are looking at us. Well, remember, we're our brother's keeper. We've got to care one for another, what other people, you know, for the client. And we live in day and age, I don't care about what people think about me. <laughs> I mean, do we not live like that? I don't care about what they say about me. I don't care about that. I don't care. Well, look, if you're a Christian, you've got to care about what people think about you because you're bearing the name of Christ. You're a Christian. You've got Christ's name. So people can look at you and say, wow, just like a husband, a wife bears the last name of her husband. And you got to try to uphold that name. So that's the whole point of our testimony to the lost world. People, get you, people look at you and say, wow, something different about you. You got something that I don't got. You know? And it gets them to want to get saved, want to know about our Lord and Savior. So he says, my answer to them that do examine me uh, is this. Then he says, um, he, he's, he's, he's listing these privileges that he has as an apostle. He says, have we not power to eat and drink? Now, we just, we just looked at that last week on, on the whole dietary stuff about eating meat offered to idols and stuff. Paul says an idol is nothing. So I don't care what they did with this piece of meat. You know, they, the, what they were doing this, in this day and age, they were taking a cow and they were, they were killing it and they were offering it up to their gods. And then people in Corinth thought that that piece of meat's cursed, or that piece of meat got bad spirits to it, and if I eat that meat, then I'm going to get demon-possessed or something. And Paul says an idol's nothing. Meat don't commend you to God. Neither if you eat, don't, it don't commend you. God's not saying, okay, because he turned down that piece of meat, he's in better fellowship with me. Or because he ate that piece of meat, he's in better fellowship with me. It's not about that. So the meat itself isn't the problem, but it's, look at verse number 9 real quick in chapter 8. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours 
become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So once again, they, they, had, they might have the right to eat certain things offered to idols, but that doesn't mean they should have done it. Okay, that's something that, that we've got to get down. So Paul says, have we not power, in verse number 4, have we not power to eat and drink? Well, the inferred answer is yes. I'm an apostle. I go down to the grocery store and get food just like you can. Okay? And I'm no different than, than you guys. Have we not power to eat and drink? Well, sure we do. Okay? There's not certain limitations and restrictions that, oh, an apostle, he, he can't eat certain things. Or No, he said, have we not power to eat and drink? The inferred answer is, yeah, they had power to do it. They had power to do it. But we're going to see certain times where Paul, remember what he said in verse number 13? Look, in the last chapter. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. You try, you try that one. You know what I'm saying? That really shows you obviously how selfish we are because he, Paul's saying in a sense, look, if, if there's certain dietary practices and Christians follow certain diets, okay, around the world, culturally even, look, if they don't want me to eat this certain thing, I'm not going to eat it. Well, could Paul, wait? could Paul eat it? Sure he can. I ain't going to send him to hell. He could. But he, he denies his self for the sake of other people. That's the principle that he's trying to teach here. Have we not power to eat and drink? The answer is yes. They could, they could if they wanted to. Um, Galatians chapter 2. You don't got to turn there. But Galatians chapter 2, Paul, uh, Paul gets into that whole thing with Peter. And, they're in, and Peter's eating with the Gentiles. A Jew eating with Gentiles? That thing is like completely foreign throughout all the Bible until obviously you see the progressive thing and then all of a sudden God's grafting in both Jew and Gentile. Now they can sit at the table and have fellowship with the Lord. But remember, Peter was being two-faced there. Peter was sitting down at the table, a Jew, okay, born a Jew. And Peter, I would always like to think, Peter is eating baby back ribs and he's eating, he got the baked beans there and he got you know, the cornbread and he got all this good stuff. He got the, the shrimp and the fried oysters or whatever. All the things that Jews couldn't eat before now all of a sudden he's eating them. And then when a group of Jews walks in the back room, he gets up off the table like he's not eating it. You know, there's a little hypocrisy with Peter. And Paul rebuked him right to the face and said, look, you're, we're not saved by the law no more. What are you doing? You're, you're causing people to, you know, you're, doing, you're, having, you're setting a stumbling block. You know, you're getting people to think that I have, you imagine if I got up here and started preaching, anybody that eats pork is going to hell. I mean, you imagine that, you know, in, in like, I mean, it'd be crazy, you know, so people, but in the early church, they didn't have the right doctrines yet until it was progressing. People thought that, wow, I have to keep dietary laws in order to stay saved or get saved. And, and Paul rebuked Peter right to the face and made that thing clear. You're justified by faith in what, in what Christ did. And he said, you know that, Peter. So do we have enough power to eat and drink? Well, they did. Galatians chapter two tells them that they did. Um, now, and that's the whole thing, you know, Paul's saying, you have the power to eat and drink. Don't you think we do too? Now look what he says in verse number 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So Paul's saying, look, you have the power to have a wife. Remember, we studied that in chapter 7. You have the power to have a wife if you would like to. And we studied that for a week, you know. Some people have a gift of remaining single. But if you're burning in lust one toward another, you better go out and find yourself a spouse so that you don't commit fornication, you don't sin, a husband and a wife. But some people have a gift and a calling to remain single. Some people have a gift and a calling are going to get married. In Paul, he's, uh, the apostle's no different. I like Paul. He's saying, I ain't no Roman Catholic. I ain't a priest. I can get married if I want to get married. But yet there's a group of people out there that teach, no, no, you can't get married. You know, Pope Francis, no, no, no wife. You're not allowed to have wives. Well, what do you mean? Peter... Your, your supposed first pope had a wife. We, we learned about it in, in, uh, in, uh, in Jesus. We know Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. If you have a mother-in-law, you have a wife. So Peter had a wife. And it's interesting that that play that Paul's trying to say here is, well, in the earlier chapters, I got some writings from you that you said you followed Peter. Okay, and then, and then uh, Paul's writing, well, Peter has, had a wife. You don't think I have the power to have a wife? If I wanted to, I'm going on all these mission trips. I have the power to have a wife if I wanted to, but I choose not to. That's the Apostle Paul. That was his calling. He remained single his whole life. Okay? Now, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? Now, another good thing that's interesting to note there 
is if, uh, the ideal marriage is between a Christian and a Christian. And look, notice that. And if you looked at that as, you, you know, my wife, she's my wife, but she's my sister. <laughs> we share the same father, the heavenly fa- our Heavenly Father. So that's a whole lot, you know, in a, the first Adam and Eve, well, in a sense, they were brother and sister, okay? So, in the spiritually speaking, you know, my, my wife, she's my, she's my physical wife, but spiritually, that's my sister. Now, that ought to be a good little comfort thing when you're when with your partner, with your spouse and stuff. You're not, she's not just, your, your, my, you know, my wife and, and the husband just to roll over and dominate her and you listen to me and you shut up and, you know, no, well, hold, no, no. You look at her also as, she's my sister in Christ. So, that's a, I think that's a little, little blessing there about, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? Paul's not for incestuous marriages. <laughs> Okay, because 1 Corinthians chapter 5 said it's commonly reported among you that there's fornication among you that one should have his father's wife. Okay, and Paul said that's, that's fornication. That's, that's bizarre. That's an abomination. So this isn't a sister. This isn't giving permission for you to marry your sister. This is a sister in the Lord. Okay, we've got to get that down because there's some weirdos out there and stuff, you know. Now, um, uh, verse number 6. Okay, well, it's interesting. He goes... Um, he says, uh, Peter, so Peter had a wife. Other apostles, they could have a wife. As the brethren of the Lord, you know, Jesus Christ, after the virgin birth, had a couple brothers and sisters, okay? The, after the virgin birth, you've got to get that. And the, and the brethren of the Lord in Cephas. So it's all inferred that they all had wives, and Paul himself had the power to have a wife if he wanted to. But he didn't. And then look at verse 6. Or I only in Barnabas, okay? Have we not power... To forbear working. Forbear working. Now, forbear, that means to stop, to cease, to abstain, or to decline. Have, do we not have power to just stop working and go full-time into the ministry? Now, this is where he gets here. He spends the remaining part of this chapter on, this, on the sheep taking care of the preacher. <laughs> All right, and that's why I like Dr. Ruckman saying, the Christian's duty to financially support his ministers. You won't ever hear me. I, I, I don't got one message in my arsenal about tithing and giving. This, this Christian out there, that's all they do. They preach and preach and preach. They'll send out three, four offerings all about the money. So this is why I, I, I tend to, you know, not talk about it. But there, we're in chapter 9. I've got to address it. I've got to talk about it now. <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't stall any longer. I've got to continue on going with this thing. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 6. Or I only have we not power to forbear working. Now what he's saying there is, you know, there's other preachers in Corinth that, that preach for a living. Okay? And you don't think that we have the same power to just stop working and have you, and have you Corinthians support us in, in full-time ministry? They had the power to do that. Okay? Um, now I'll come to Acts 18. Now did Paul work a secular job, so to say? Well, he did. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 18. What do you do? Paul, look at Acts chapter 18. Page number 1464, if you have a Bible in the pew. 1464. This is Acts chapter 18. This, like I said, this is how we learn the Scriptures. We've got to go verse by verse. All the Bible fits together, and, and it explains itself. That's why the Bible is, is the greatest interpreter of the Bible. You know, so, you know, Paul says, Could we, do we have power to forbear working while you look up? Well, did Paul work? And what does Paul say about working and things like that? Paul had a great deal to say about working. Look at Acts chapter 18. Look at verse number, uh, Acts 18, 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to where? To Corinth. That's where he's, ri- he's writing to the Corinthians. He came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and come unto them. Now look at this. Verse 3. And because he was of the same craft, Aquila, he abode with them in rot. That's worked. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. They, Aquila and Priscilla. Paul made his living with a, with a needle and some canvas. When you think of that. Paul made his living getting these skins and stretching them out and, and tanning them or whatever they did and drying them out and replacing holes and that thick canvas and sewing, making tents. Okay, Paul made tents uh, for a living. 
and he, he was working with his hands, okay? Now, come back to 1 Corinthians 9. You know, Paul, he did that. Paul made tents for a living because there was not enough support coming in from the other churches in Corinth. Uh, one of the things that the, that the Corinthian church really wasn't too good at was ministering to the, you know, to the right people, so to say. There might have been other preachers and other apostles that the church of Corinth was supporting, so to say, but then there's the Apostle Paul. I'm out here working, man. I still got a job. And there's other, pre there's other apostles, so-called apostles and preachers out there. You're paying them people full time to, to, to there. And then there's Paul. He's sitting there working and stuff. So they had power to forbear work in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse number 6. Have we not power to forbear working? Now, another thing I, I was thinking about is, um, you know, it, Paul says, look, now we have power to for, forbear working, but if the money's not there, then we're going to go get a job. And we're going to go get a job, and, and, uh, and it's interesting, but, you know, the Church of Corinth, it's almost like, look, you should know that it's not right to spend your money on idols and spend your money on, you know, meat sacrifice to idols, and that should get a couple, you know, extra money in your pocket here to help support godly men and, and other preachers and ministers and stuff. But, uh, you know, Paul's kind of taking like a, he's like, he's like slighting them, he's taking a little jab at them, because some preachers were full-time getting support, and then there's Paul, I believe the greatest Christian ever walked the earth, not getting that, you know, and that's why you see Paul's sarcasm throughout the whole book. You, got, you are rich, and you are increased with goods, and, and you are wise, and we are despised. We are made as the filth of the world, and we are poor, and you see Paul, you could tell he's trying to convict them a little bit. You guys have all this stuff. All, you're increased with goods. And then there's, there's the, a true remnant of Bible-believing Christians, the Apostle Paul. The guy got two coats on. He got two jackets to his name. You know, so there's a, there's a couple of things Paul's trying to convict them a bit, okay? Now, you know, if, if you're a preacher, okay, if you ever get any man that gets called to preaching in the ministry, you obviously better be willing to work, okay? You better be willing to work. And, um, you know, and there's the whole thing, well, you know, um, some, some of the people, okay, let's say a preacher works, you know, I, I work full-time from, from my dad back here, okay, working in his uh, contracting business and stuff. And there's, some, there's some preachers that have to do that, they have to work, and then, the, and then the people end up getting mad at the preacher because, oh, he's not studied up. He's not, he's not giving, he's feeding me baby food week in and week out. Well, look, the guy got a full, he got a job let alone taking care of, you know, how do you expect them to go to the hospital and, and, go, to, and go to nursing homes and clean the church up and do this and, and, and do all the things that a, a minister should do and then on top of have a 40-hour job a week and on top of taking care of his wife because you're married, that introduces a whole other thing of uh, troubles and stuff, trouble in the flesh. I'm not saying that obviously, but you know what I'm saying. Trouble in the flesh, Paul talks about because you, you might get carried away with the things of the world so much and that's part of it once you get married. You've got to take care. You've got to take care of your wife. You've got to provide for her and stuff. So, that's, that's a part of it, but, you know, you know, the congregants, sometimes they get all messed up because they expect so much from a preacher that's doing all, that's, that's working a full-time job and want to get fed like, you know, like, like he's like Dr. Ruckman up there or he's, you know, he's like the next, you know, all this brilliant stuff in the Bible. Sometimes you got you to gotta turn it down a little bit. Now, if there's preachers out there in the, in the full-time ministry that are giving you 20-minute messages and not studying and not preparing and feeding you, <laughs> hey, you have every right. What are you doing, dude? You, you got to... You got to study. You got to. You got to get. You got to get more into the Word of God. You got to give me something new instead of week in and week out telling me the same thing over and over again about salvation and in Christ. And he walked on water. He fed people with five thousand. That's all good stuff. But there's a lot more. You know, churches now they don't like preaching about the end times. They don't like talking about things that displease them. They just want to get their ears tickled and entertained and stuff like that. Um, you know, that's that's a whole other thing. Now Paul worked. Okay, the point is Paul did work, and uh, he worked, and he commanded to work, and he led by example to work, but at the end of the day, Paul didn't have to work, okay? Now, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, the pastor, you know, he, he, uh, what, what, a, what a job he got. He gets up behind the pulpit, he shoots his mouth off twice a week, and then he rolls, he rolls away in his suit and tie and his nice little car, and he drives away. I wish I had that job. <laughs> people always kind of get at the pastors and stuff like that. Look, it's a hard thing to, to get called into the ministry and start preaching and looking at faces over and over again and, and convicting them about their sin and convicting them and trying to preach them and, and feed them a, a decent meal and stuff. It's not, you know, some people get the idea that, well, if you're not out there roofing, 
If you're not out there laying block, if you're not out there paving concrete, if you're not out there busting your back, you ain't working. <laughs> you know? Well, how many of us work AC? How many of you work AC jobs? Work inside of a building? Raise your hand. Okay? I understand there may much, much AC back in the kitchen back here, but you work in a building. How many people sit at the desk and they type up finances and spread charts and graph che sheets and, all, and Venn diagrams and do all that and budget and stuff and bankers or whatever? Well, that still work, is it not? That still work. It's different than us people that are out there in the field busting our backs and stuff, but, you know, more power to you. You got a good, you got a good job. You got to working in a building, an AC, whatever. So that's work. But yet people look at the ministry, they look at the pastor, that ain't work. He's just up there shooting his mouth off. <laughs> I mean, whoa. You know, that's a, it's, the ministry is work. Now, strangely, the Christians of, of Corinth, you know, even today, somehow they think that everyone who does something for them is entitled to get paid except for the person who ministers the Word of God to them. Let me just repeat that. Everybody expects to get paid. Okay, so here's what they think. They say, well, the preacher, he's, he's, he's feeding us the Word of God. We shouldn't pay him at all because he's doing it because he loves Jesus. Okay, that's what, they, that's what they'll say. But here's the thing, though. All right, you got a guy, a Christian guy, he's coming to fix your car. Are you going to pay him? Of course, you're going to pay the guy. He's a, but he's a Christian. He's, he should just fix my car for Jesus. <laughs> He loves Jesus. Just fix it for free, man, you know? Or a guy, he's coming to plumb your toilet. He's a Christian. I'm just plumbing your house for free, man. I'm a Christian. Huh? Well, you know, they, they, they don't use that standard for everybody else. Everybody else that does work for them, hey, you expect to pay them. But yet that mentality changes. Well, he's a minister of the Word of God. He's a pastor up there. Don't pay that guy. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, pay, don't pay the preacher. So that's, one of the, that's, a, that's what they get, you know? And that, that's, that's not the right, um, you know, if you, if you want to use that line... Well, go at the end of your two weeks right before you end up getting paid. Go tell your boss he's about to hand you a paycheck. Said, I just did it for Jesus. <laughs> you know, I just Brad did it for Jesus all week. You ever look, no. You know, so all those other occupations. You may be a Christian. Well, you've got to pay the guy for the time that he's putting into to doing the work. That's work. Well, so is the ministering of the Word of God. That's, that's work. Now, um, like I guess Christians have the mentality that the preacher is to feed them the Word of God and have no return of investment, okay? Now, Paul expounds on this, okay? He expounds on this whole principle that he's going to go into in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. He explains this forbear of working thing. They have power to do it if they, if they needed to. Verse 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? All right, now pause and think about that. There ain't a soldier out there, okay, that fights his way in war, that doesn't get his stuff supported. We buy him boots. We buy him ammunition. We buy his guns. We buy his clothes, his uniform. We buy his gear. We buy his equipment. No soldier goes out there at his own charges. That's why I got the government. You got people out there supporting our army, and they're not going out there on their own wages and buying all. I'm going to buy my. I'm going to buy this gun. I'm going to buy this attachment. I'm going to buy my nice helmet. No, look, we the government. You know, us people and stuff even. We, we pay them to go out there and fight. Uh, no soldier pays his own way in warfare. Now look at the next thing he says. Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? So in other words, nobody faults the vineyard worker for after he put all that work and labor and effort, hey, I'm going to enjoy a peach or I'm going to enjoy a, a, a grape or I'm going to enjoy some of the fruit of, of, my, of my vineyard. Okay? You know, if you go and plant a vineyard, you're entitled to eat the fruit of it, okay? You did the work, so you're entitled to, to, to eat off of it. No farmer, right? Another one he says is, Who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk? All right, now that's a good, that's a good thing. I'd be cheese. You know, obviously don't eat milk. You don't eat milk, but you eat, you eat cheese, okay? And eateth not of the milk of the flock. So no farmer obviously refuses you know, to eat a piece of cheese after he done all that work that he just put into it, okay? Now, there's three pictures of the ministry. I'm going to run through these real quick. You see why I'm not liking this message? Because a lot, some of the times the message is directed to you guys and, and directed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now some of this the message, it's like, it's, it's like about me. That's why I don't like these types of things. They make me, they make me uncomfortable, but um, I, I hope that it's, the it point's getting made here. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
I uh, went Second Timothy. Uh, come back to chapter two, page fifteen eighty nine. So the ministry, Paul likens it unto three things. He likens it unto a soldier going into battle. He likens it unto a husbandman planting a vineyard. And he likens it unto a shepherd feeding a flock. And, then, and we're going to continue with our, in the Corinthians. He likens the Christian life unto certain other fields like athletes and fighters. And we're getting that on another thing. He's talking about the Christians and stuff. But this is a, look what he says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 2. One of, my, one of my favorite verses, honestly. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. In the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul writing to young Timothy, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. One of the jobs as a pastor is I'm up here to try to, to feed you, to teach you, so that you shall be able to teach others also. Okay? Who shall be able to teach others also. Now look what he says in verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A lot of stuff in the ministry, a lot of stuff being, it, this ain't, it's not soft stuff. It's not just a, it's a soft, no, it's, it's endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. One of the hardest balances of all is not to get tangled up in every single thing going on in life and every single thing going on in the world. But to, you're, hey, look, you're fighting a spiritual battle. you got to remind people that. you got to convict them against sin. you got to get people that are so just obsessed and infatuated with entertainment and media and the things of the world. They watch TV. They watch they do all kinds of stuff. And then they come in here for one hour a week. And like, you know, like the old saying is, is I, I try to come up here and try to undo all the filth that you put in through your mind start the rest of the week. <laughs> That's hard. Okay, it's a, it's a battle. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him, hath chosen him to be a soldier. Where well, there's one. Second Timothy 2 6, come down a little bit more. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. He talks about a husbandman. Now, if, uh, if you want to turn there, I'll just read it. Peter. Peter knows about this one. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say to Peter? Peter, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Feed my, then he says, feed my sheep. You know? It's like, look, you've got to start out with the little lambs first. And then, then, if we, then we'll get you to the, to the sheep and stuff. But he told Peter, and that's, that's a pastor. All right? Pastor. Uh, 1 Peter 5, he says. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 2. Feeding the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. You're not just out there. You're not out there for the money. If I'm up here preaching for money, I'm in the wrong field, man. <laughs> that is not the case at all. Not, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither being lords over God's heritage. I got a, I got a study coming up. I'm trying to prepare on you know, signs of a cult. What is, it, what is an occult? And one of the sure signs of an occult is somebody's up there, you dare not ever speak against me. And this, this book's the final authority. Where I cross this book, you throw me out the window and you take God's word any day. Okay? And, and people are lording over your soul. Well, you're not doing this enough. And you're not doing this enough. And you're not reading your Bible enough. You're not praying enough. And I don't even think you're saved. You're going to hell. And, and it, it's just a constant lording over you. And they're constraining you. They're like bringing you back under bondage. One of the sure signs of a cult. One of the, what's the biggest cult in all the entire world? Roman Catholicism. <laughs> you see, I can't even believe Roman Catholicism. They'll tell you, look, if you don't do certain things, you don't come to church on Sunday, you don't take the mask, you don't take the Eucharist, you don't get confirmed, you don't get baptized, you don't do these things week in and week out, oh, you're not going to go to heaven. They lord over your soul. They lord over your soul. Is what people do. You've got to watch out for that. Now come back a little bit. Okay, come back a little bit. Just give me like 15 more minutes here, okay? just want to finish this chapter off. Um, let's see here. Let me go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So in the ministry, Paul's going to say, you got the right to live off the ministry just as a soldier is paid by the government to fight. A farmer makes a living off of his crop. A shepherd lives off the flock. So he's going to say there's nothing wrong with a preacher that gets paid for ministering the Word of God. Okay? And we're, but now we're going to notice in the end of this chapter, Paul, he had a right to get paid. And Paul didn't do it. 
He didn't take it. There's in the church of Philippians, he was all for it. But there was people in the church of Corinthians that was that would be off about it. And, and you know, oh, you know, Paul, I, I don't even trust the guy to begin with, let alone giving, you know, uh, helping support him and stuff like that. So there were some things where when he's at Corinth, man, he was working. Okay? He was working. So you can't you obviously can't be you can't be afraid to work if you get into the ministry. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look what he says in verse number 8 now. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. Now, Paul is what he's, what he's pretty much saying. Am I just saying this thing as a man? Am I just saying this in the flesh here? No. I got biblical grounds for what I'm saying. Okay? That's what Paul's kind of saying. And he goes back to Deuteronomy 25, verse number 4. If you want to turn there, you can read it there. Or Paul pretty much just quotes it here. He says, For it is written in the law of Moses... Notice Paul going back to the Old Testament, using a verse in the Old Testament, making a New Testament application to it. Okay, So he says, uh, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Okay, And then Paul, and then he, and then he adds in his little interpretation or, or his point on that, Doth God take care for oxen? So in other words, look, we're not, we're not, we're not oxen's out there threshing the corn, okay? Well, it's, it, the farmer has no right to muzzle that ox. So when that ox working and threshing that corn and stomping on that stuff, that he can't bend his head down and, and eat some food, eat some corn real quick, and continue to work and go. You're not, to, you're not to muzzle the mouth of the ox. You're to let him eat of the work that he's putting into it. You see, you see that little... Ill illustration there. Uh, does God take care for oxen? Well, yeah, sure He does. He, like I said, you know, yet I like Proverbs: "A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel." That whole animal cruelty stuff and just beating up and killing animals for no reason—that stuff is wicked. You know, the, a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. You got no right muzzling the mouth of an ox while that ox is out there threshing and plowing. And he can't bend down for a second and get some food. <laughs> so, and then look how Paul applies this. Look at verse ten. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? And so is he saying that just for animals, or could we get an application to it? Look what he says in verse 10. For our sakes, no doubt this is written. He likens himself to be an ox. An oxen threshing and plowing. Okay? And if God takes care of the ox, you don't think he's going to take care of the, of the preacher? He's going to allow the preacher to, to eat and, and reap the benefits of, 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 the, of his vineyard and of his flock and stuff like that? Uh, okay, so, um, you know, that's, that's the whole thing from it. If God made provision for the ox, he'll make provision for the preacher. And if God treats the animal that way, don't you think he'll treat his ministers better? Well, sure, well, sure he will. Look what he says in verse number, um, verse number uh, 10. Uh, well, here, I want to I pause on this because there's a couple good things on here that, that, we could, that we can get out of there. Now, Paul, he applies that verse to the New Testament, and he talks about, in verse number 10, that he that ploweth, should plow in hope. And he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. So there's another thing. A minister, he likens it unto being an ox. And he, liken, he likens the ministry, the ministering of plowing and threshing. Now I'm a little, I'm pretty much a city boy. I didn't know much about, I don't know what a stock of wheat and corn. <laughs> I had to look all this stuff up to get this stuff down. Okay, And, and when I start, once I researched it for a minute, I'm like, wow. There's a lot of blessings inside of this thing here. So I'm going to just pause and talk about this for a little bit. So a lot of the ministry is spent, time, it's spent on plowing the ground, and it's spent on threshing. All right, so plowing, in order to plow, you need, obviously you need to write tools, you need to write equipment. There's a bit of finances that you need before you start getting into it, okay? You know, and look, what do you start out as? You start out by getting a tool, a hand tool. And doing that thing and plowing that ground, chewing up that ground, you start out with a hand tool, okay? And next thing you know, you may get to save up a little bit. Next thing you know, you may get an animal. And then, then you got to get the equipment for the animal. And then now in modern day and age, you know, you, I was looking up the history of all this stuff. Then they got these big machines out there. Now, I, this was like back, I was looking at some black and white documentary I was looking, looking at. But they, nowadays, I don't know, they probably, they've got them big wide things. You probably see plowing the ground and chewing that up. But they had to start somewhere, okay? They had to start somewhere and start uh, to rototilling that dirt. They had to use their hands. They had to work their way up. 
Now, you never plant the seed until the ground is broken up. Now, you rarely can toss a seed out the window and have that thing just bang, just, just sprout up like nothing. I mean, you could do, I mean if, it's a, if it's a weed or something like that, I mean, them things, you, you know, you plant them anywhere, dandelions or whatever, or just a weed, they, they grow quick. But it's a, it's a weed. It don't really do, you don't, as a matter of fact, you pull them things out, okay? So there's a point that, um, you know, tossing the seed sometimes just ain't good enough. You may get an idea of, okay, you know, you may, you may get lucky, you know, the, the seed falls on good ground, and man, that thing, that thing took it like that. But for the most part, you've got to till the ground. And that's the whole thing. Most likely, you're never going to win a soul to Christ who hasn't in some way been broken and that's ready to receive the Lord. People, why, why in the world am I going to receive Jesus Christ? Why am I going to, world am I going to receive a Savior if, first off, I don't even believe I'm a sinner? There's people out there that believe that. <laughs> you're not ready to receive the Savior until that ground gets chewed up. You need to, you got to come to God in a broken state, okay, in a contrite heart. And, you know, most of the time, if people like that, they come to you, they receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people that are comfortable and, ah, I'm, I'm cool with my life, and they're not going to receive the Lord. They need to get their ground tore up, broken down. They need to get humbled. They need to get that, knock that arrogance and that pride. Then they'll be able to receive, you know, receive our Savior. So the ground got to be broken up. Um, and you th and think about it, sometimes, you know, you may plow and plow and plow and try to get the ground to receive that seed and yet nothing happens. Okay, you pray and pray. I pray for so-and-so to get saved. Nothing happens. I pray for so-and-so, you know, brother or sister to, to get right and nothing happens. You know, I sit up here preaching and preach and preach the Word. I pray, Lord, somebody, people just get changed and stuff like that by the power of the Word of God. Nothing happens. A lot of the ministry, it's just plowing and plowing and plowing. It's a lot of labor, okay? Ministry is like plowing, okay? And I find that true sometimes when, you know, working after, you know, 40-hour week in a laboring job and stuff, I get up here preach a me uh, two messages a week. I feel like I'm more tired after preaching a, a message like this or a message on Thursday than I am after doing a roof on, on, on a hot day or something like that. It's a, it's a, the ministry is a spiritual and physical effort, okay? Now, the illustration on threshing, I thought this was pretty neat too. Now, those farmers, they'd go out there with a sickle. I haven't seen one of them in I don't know how long, okay? They went out, there, they went out with a sickle, like a sword, and they'd cut those wheat stalks from out of the field, okay? Then would come a group of young men and young women. They'd gather up all these wheat stalks. They'd gather them up in the, in the bundles, and they were called sheaves, okay? Bringing in the sheaves. We, we sing that song. They would gather up them, these bundles, and they'd call them sheaves. And then once the reaping was completed... They would, carry, they would carry these bundles of sheaves to the threshing floor, okay, which was built, you know, I looked at some of these old things, it was pretty neat. They were built from stone, and they, they had like a hard floor to them. They'd bring these bundles, they'd toss them on there. And then the stalks of wheat, they were turned into three different types of things. They were turned into grain, they were turned into straw, and they were turned into chaff, okay. And the first step in processing that wheat was to... Um, was to, they, they had to separate, I like that, separate the valuable grain from the straw and from the chaff. There was a separation going on, okay? And they would use a threshing stick or they would use a, an animal, okay, or a, a threshing sledge and they would, or, or a threshing wheel and the farmers out, would go out there with these threshing sticks and beat that pile of bundles. They'd beat, they'd beat the, the, the sheaves. They'd beat it up, beat it up, okay? And, uh, and, or, or those animals would go over and they'd stomp at, they'd crush them, and this is all for separation. Now, what am I talking about up here? This is all still part of the ministry, okay? Now, and I look at it, okay, you go out into the field with a sword. The Bible is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing, you know, that whole verse. You go out there with a sword, and you start, you know, you, you go out there, you cut some people, you gather some people, you know, bringing in the sheaves, you gather them up in a bundle. You bring them back to the threshing floor. You bring them back to the church house <laughs> where, the, where the preacher's up there with his sword cutting and crushing and slicing and trying to get you separated from all that dirt and grime and stuff that you got attached to you from the, from the world and stuff like that. And next thing you know, another thing is once it was all beat, they, it was all beat up and stuff, is then they'd go in with a pitchfork and toss that stuff up into the air, okay? And all the... Um, what is it? All the, all the, like the chaff from the wind, it would blow away the farthest. It would be way out there. And then the straw would fall closer 
and then you'd have the grain. It was the heaviest, okay, and that's the valuable stuff. It would fall right, right near the guy that's, that's threshing it. And you do that a couple times over and over again, and then by the time you know it, that big bundle of sheave that you got is, re is reduced down to a handful. You mean tell me, I just put all that labor, and I, I thought I was going to have all this big harvest, you know, I'm reaping all this, and we got a little handful of valuable grain. <laughs> and that's the problem. One of the things with the, in the mega churches and modern churches, they don't want to thresh. They don't want to plow. They don't want to, they don't want to beat down, convict from sin, get, to start to have a changed life and live for the Lord. And it's all this comfortable and entertainment and give me goosebumps. And I know all about that stuff. Okay, and that's part. That's that's what they do. And next thing you, you got, yeah, look at our numbers: thousand in attendance. Yeah, they're a bunch of sheaves. <laughs> they're, they're they're a bunch of straw. They're a bunch of chaff. And you read what Jesus Christ says, man. That stuff. The angels are going to gather them, and one one gets tossed in the. What do they do with the with the hay, in, uh, chaff, burning them up, gather them up in bundles and burn them. Now that's pretty wild. And that's sad to say, man, there's a lot of people in them churches that are lost as, lost as a golf ball in high weeds. You know what I'm saying? They're lost. Okay? And that's sad. That's sad. They're under fault. And it's, we know, we did study, it's the majority, it's the many that, that get carried away with all that. So that's part of the ministry. Now, 1 Corinthians, uh, I'm just going to run through this here. I know I was going to spend too much time on that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number uh, 10 here, okay? So he gets, he gets on, they that plow should plow in hope. The whole point of why you're plowing is you're hoping you're going to get a return of investment that I'm going to yield something and I'm going to be able to continue on with my business, going to continue to uh, you know, have, that, have that occupation I have is going to pay for my bills and stuff like that. He that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. That's why you all sit in here at work. Because you hope at the end of the week I'm going to get paid and I'm going to hope that I'm going to have enough to you know, carry about with, with, my, with my life and stuff like that. So, um, and that's the whole thing. Threshing, threshing is worse than plowing because before, you know, plowing is before you plant. So the plowing has to do most likely with the unsaved. Okay, getting the ground broken down to receive the Lord and stuff. But the threshing is something that happened after the harvest. And that's part of the preaching in, in the ministry. A lot of the, a pastor's job is preaching just sanctification, which is separation. Separating from this and, and don't do this. and don't, I mean, and it's, it's not just me telling you, don't do this and don't do that, don't do this. That's why I try hard not to push my personal convictions onto people. I have some convictions that, look, if we could see eye to eye on it, that's a blessing. But all the, it should line up with the Word of God. That's why I do, I want the Word of God to convince you and persuade you. Not just, not just the pastor or the preacher up there, okay? So, nah, 1 Corinthians 9.11 If we have sown unto you spiritual things... Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So the ministry is showing spiritual things. So pretty much Paul says, is it a great thing that we should reap carnal things? That you should take care of our carnal needs? The needs of the flesh in a sense? The implied answer is no. So, uh, you know, in other words, a man that gets out in the ministry and gets to ministering the Word of God to him is ministering spiritual things. And part of the duty of, of, the, of the flock and of the herd and all that is to take care of uh, is to take care of the preacher now um, the ministry you know and this is the thing with, with Paul and his mindset the ministry it's like no different the ministry of uh, past it's not like some elevated or exalted class where you know I got some angelic halo on and I'm, I'm like elevated above all the people no that you're out of line if you think that's what what a preacher is <laughs> okay okay nor is the is a preacher to be treated like you know just like a, a piece of garbage Okay, well, you're out of line if you, you know, and he has to take a vow of celibacy and a vow of, uh, vow of poverty. And he has to just come in here in dirt and sackcloth and ashes. And, you know, so you could get far out of line with that also, okay? A pastor at the end of the day is, is one of you. There's no elevated position of, uh, in a sense of that where there's, there's a spiritual equality with, with that. And people have different looks and, uh, about all that stuff. Now, um, you know, people look at the preacher like God's supposed to send him, you know, money out of the sky when nobody else lives like that. You know, and Paul wants them to understand that, um, you know, look, they're, they're, you're going to have to take care of your ministers. And now here's where it comes to get a little personal. You know, I remember pastoring Bible Baptist Church for my first year. I didn't want to take nothing. 
didn't take because you know why? Because I was afraid, scared to death, that people would sit there. Look at this young punk up here. He's coming up. He's just preaching for money. <laughs> so I said, forget that. I don't want to. I don't want to take no paycheck from people. And it took one person. It took Shelly to come in and, and check in. Hey, are you taking a paycheck yet? No, no, I'm not, not, not yet. I've been thinking about. I've been praying about it. I, I don't know how to go about this. You know, I'm new to the whole church thing and all that. So I'm not sure. She said, you got to take a paycheck. And we went. She actually sent me this passage. I'm like, yeah, it's a. That's good. Next thing I know, we went to Pastor Jack. God married me. Preacher to married me. And I went down. I had a meeting with him about marriage and paycheck. Getting paid in the ministry. Interesting conversation. And he said, look, man, he said, you know, you, 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 you at least got to be taking 100 bucks a week. I said, 100 bucks a week. I looked at that. Okay, I do Bible study Thursday night. Do Sunday morning. That's like 50 bucks a service. Yeah, 50 bucks a service. That, that's not bad. Okay, so I was like, okay, Lord, I, I'll, I'll go with that. Take 100 bucks a week. You know, now it's up to 125 bucks a week. He said, what, what happened there? Well, inflation happened. <laughs> but no, not only that, but my, my wife, I got married. Now I can't, it's not just, and I would use that 100 bucks. I thought that was the most valuable thing. I use that 100 bucks, I go get gas with it. You know, people, the, the sheep were filling my tank up. Next thing you know, my boss, he comes over with a company credit card. He says, here, Vin, take this and pay for your gas. Look at it as a weekly tithe to, to your church. You can pay for your gas. Now I use 125 bucks to, to elsewhere. You know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a big deal. And, um, and, and that was the whole thing. Is I, I, was a, I was afraid and scared to death to get up there because I knew there might be people out there. Who's this guy? I, I don't trust him. I'm not, I'm not paying that guy. I, you know, what's his motive? You know, what's he just trying? Is he, is he just want our money and stuff like that? <laughs> you get to thinking, you know, you know we want, I, think it was, I, believe it was, I believe it was Miriam that said, you marry a preacher... Oh, they, they're not going to get a lot, they're not going to make a lot of money. You know what I mean? It's not a field that, that, that makes a lot of money. And, and praise the Lord, I got a good wife that isn't, you know, extremely high strung. And, oh, I need this, I want that, I need this. And uh, so there's, there's a balance with that. And, you know, I talked to other preachers and stuff about salaries and things like that and how they do it, but they're full time. And if it was to ever come to a time where Lord willing it, okay, you're going to talk about a salary, I'd ask everybody in here, what's the lowest, somebody, the lowest thing that people make? And I'd take out as a salary. And if she said, look, you want, to, you want to bless me anymore? I'd put a little box in the back, and you could slide in something if you want to bless anymore. But I'd take the lowest, anybody that makes the lowest amount of money, I'd take their salary and learn how to live with it. But that would be full-time ministry. So, you know, now there's, there's times where you got to work, okay? you you, you got to, uh, you know, and that's the whole blessing. Look, if, if I'm going to spend 40 hours working and, and, and just, you know, two hours uh, feeding the Word of God and, and ministering to the sheep, then so be it. But I like to think that I'm not up here just, just giving you just baby food week in and week out, and you know it takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot of time that you know that I that I hey I could be spending time with my wife going out and just live. I mean that's a whole other thing, finding that balance with the ministry and taking care of a job and taking care of a wife, and so there's a lot of sacrifices made to uh you know to try to to feed the flock. So that would be this will be one of the few and only times I ever preach about uh, uh, paying the preacher, <laughs> okay. Because, look, there's going to be people to leave out. There's going to be people to walk out of this church and say, oh, that guy talks about his money. You know? Like, and it's like the first message I ever preached on it. You know, and people, I hear stories like that in all the churches. You know, that guy talks all about money. And, you know, when he, he has like three messages on tithing or all he talks about is against alcohol. And you may have got one or two messages against alcohol and stuff. But people get that. Now, another thing, I'm almost done. I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit over. But Lord laid this on my heart. I want to just get this off my, my chest here. Now, and I do, I thank Shelly for opening up my eyes that I wish she was here, but I, I, I thank her for, for that. And, you know, it's amazing how people gripe about paying their pastors, yet they don't complain about giving to Netflix. They don't complain about giving to AT&T or giving to Verizon Wireless for their cell phone bill, but they're complaining, oh, I've got to pay, the, I gotta pay that preacher up there. <laughs> but, they can, but, you know, then, then they'll say, oh, all the preacher wants is money and money. Look, all the phone companies want is your money. All the, the dog food companies want is your money. All that, you know, all that, the, that's what people want. They want your money. And guess what? God wants your money too. So you got to be wise on, on, on where you put it. And it doesn't bug them a bit about, okay, here, I'm going to spend money on all my hobbies, hunting, fishing, going out, getting clothes or getting guns. I'm going to spend all this money on that. Oh, I got to give $100 to the preacher. <laughs> oh, man, you know, I'm going to gripe and, you're gonna, they gripe and complain about that. So... There's just some, there's just, just some things to think about. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Okay. 
Now, uh, the more work you, in, the more you invest in the work of God and the ministry of the Word, the more you invest in a church. Your heart will be there. For where you know, for, the Bible says, for where your for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's hard to leave a church that you got a lot invested into. I mean, you think about that. It's it's hard to quit a church that you that you invested in. You know, that's a so that's that's part of it. Now. Finish off these last two verses, three verses here. If others be partakers of this power over you, people partake that power. They forbear working and live off the Corinthian church. If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Okay, shouldn't, shouldn't, don't we, shouldn't we have the same right? Okay, well, they do. Now look at this. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul had the same thing. He didn't want them to think up there, I'm just up there to, to make a, a buck off of you. Okay? Can you imagine that? Here, I'm going to get ready to tell you the gospel. I'm going to get ready to tell you this mystery news. But first, you give me some money, then I'll tell you. I ain't no divinator or palm reader or fortune teller. You go to them and they get, I'm going to tell you your future, how many kids you got, and how much this, and just give me the money first, 25 bucks a palm read. <laughs> you know, that's, that's crazy. Okay? You don't, you preach the gospel, that's free of charge. You're preaching the gospel free of charge. But when it comes to ministry and working and, and counseling and trying to deal with problems and, and feeding the flock and stuff, so that's a, that's a different thing there. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Well, yeah, I read the Old Testament. The, the, the Levitical priesthood that was their living. They, they, the people would bring in animal sacrifices and kill that animal and, and butcher it up. It was like a butcher house there and stuff. But at the end of the day, what would happen is they would end up getting here. Here's your food. Here, take care. Here, here's the offering. Here's the tithe. Here's, the, here's the, the Levitical priesthood. They didn't have to work, okay, that priesthood. So that's what Paul says. The, the holy things, they which, they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. What, what were they waiting on the altar? That animal. And they partook of the altar. They partook of that animal. So they would get fed by that. That was their so-called, that was their occupation. Okay? And if it, if, you know, and there's a lot of preachers out there. Look, if it came to shutting the doors and having to close the church because we can't afford the bills, a preacher should take a pay cut like that. No doubt. You know, and, and that's and if a preacher look, if you got to work, a preacher they got to work part time, they got to work full time because to, to get the money and to, to to fulfill the rest of their needs, you better be ready to work. Okay, so that's you know, there's that balance with that. So then at the end of it, verse number fourteen, even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now um, that's how the Lord that's how the Lord wanted and. Um, you know, and, and that's why I would like look at it is okay, if the pastor feeds the sheep, why well, didn't the, the sheep ought to feed the pastor? You know, there's nothing, I don't believe there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, like I said, I'd be one of the few times I ever preach that message ever. Because <laughs> I was, like I said, I was, that's the most nervous I've ever been with, <laughs> with a message like this. So thank you for sticking with me for this. Went 10 minutes over. I'm sorry about that. Let's bow our heads. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord. I do want to just take this time here to thank you so much, Lord, for putting me into the ministry. Thank you so much, Lord, for the flock. Thank you so much, Lord, for just being so good to me, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for my wife. And for all those here, Lord, I, I love them all, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm very grateful. I look at it as an honor and privilege to just preach the Word of God, Lord. And I don't, I don't care, Lord, about, about the money. I'd, if people decided today not to give a cent more, I'd still be up here preaching every, any chance I could, Lord. I thank you so much. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that, um, that we, we live our life in, in, the, uh, in accordance with, um, with your Word. And I pray, Lord, that we think about other people's conscience and think about, Lord, we may have certain rights to do things, but that we shouldn't exercise those rights. And we actually should... Um, stay away from them because it could cause, cast stumbling blocks upon people. I pray that you help us be a better testimony, uh, help clean up our lives, Lord. Only you could change us and only you could clean us up. I pray that you help us with that. Draw us close to you, Lord, in these days we're living in. Help us stand out. Help us take a strong stance. It's like an unto a, uh, a warfare and 
a lot of hard things, Lord, so I pray that we don't fall away and we don't slip. God, continue to lift us up, Lord. Give us strength. And um, Lord, I just want to thank you for salvation. I thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for me. I thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. I thank you, Lord, that your Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I pray that, um, that if anybody that's listening, anybody listening over on, on, online or over the air, Lord, that they take this time that, that you hope, Lord, that you did plow and, and thresh and, and plow their hearts and tear up the ground a little bit, Lord, that they may be able to receive you, that they understand that they are a sinner, they can't go to heaven by their own works, and Lord, that you just came down and, and died for sinners. What a blessing. I pray that they receive you as Lord and Savior. And I um, want to make a dedication, Lord, to, to live their life for you. We ask this in all in your mighty, precious name, Lord, of Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing one song and we're going to be done. Matter of fact, let's cut the song. No song here. We're just going to be done. No, no singing. I, I took, kept you guys too long here today. All righty, Jordan, would you mind cutting that?